Hanımefendiler, beyefendiler hoş geldiniz. Çok kısa bir süre içerisinde oturumumuz başlayacak. O yüzden salondaki e, kıymetli misafirlerimizin yerlerini almalarını önemli rica edeceğim. Finansal piyasalardaki dönüşüm ve Türkiye başlıklı oturumla huzurlarınızdayız efendim. Bloomberg sponsorluğunda gerçekleşiyor bu e, oturum. Gene e, hatırlatalım her oturumdan önce yaptığımız gibi eğer panelistlerimize sorularınız var ise bu soruları Slido uygulaması ve web sitesi üzerinden Slido'nun et a salonu tspk hashtag ile gönderebilirsiniz. E, oturum sonrasında süre kalması durumunda konuşmacılarımız moderatörün yettiği soruları yanıtlamaya gayret edecekler. Şimdi dünyada yaşanan büyüme sorunu ve çözüm önerileri, döviz kuru istikrarsızlıkları, özellikle Türkiye'nin çok ciddi sıkıntı çektiği bir alan, Türkiye'nin genel görünümü, Türkiye'ye yatırım yapacak fonların beklentileri ve buna benzer pek çok hususun Türkiye özelinde biraz dünyanın bakışının ne olduğuna dair bir panel, bir toplantı olacak. Bir hayli önemli bir toplantı olacağını söylememe gerek yok. Zaten salonun kalabalıklığı ve buradaki hazırlığının da bu konuyu ne kadar yakından takip ettiğini önemli bir göstergesi. Efendim bu panelimizin moderatörlüğünü, başkanlığını Bloomberg piyasa yapısı ve stratejisi direktörü Sayın Mark Howard gerçekleştirecek. Ben önce Mark Howard'ı davet etmek istiyorum. Mr. Howard, would you please? Thank you. Ve değerli panel konuşmacılarımız, Uluslararası Finans Endüstri Genel Müdür ve Baş Ekonomisti Sayın Robin Brooks. Mr. Brooks, would you please? Thank you. Fitch Ratings MEA Ülkeleri Direktörü Sayın Ed Parker, Mr. Parker. Thank you very much. Ve Goldman Sachs yönetim direktörü Sayın Zeynep Yenel. Sayın Yenel buyurun lütfen. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I wish you a very successful session. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning everybody and uh, welcome to this first panel session on the second day of this uh, excellent conference. Uh, we are talking uh, in this session about the transformation of financial markets and Turkey. And we'll be looking at some of the global trends that are impacting growth markets and the specific trends that are impacting Turkey and some of the uh, recommendations and opportunities that our panel think will apply uh, to Turkey. Now, from their bios and uh, from what the panelists have told me, I don't believe any of them have any uh, Hollywood film star uh, experience, so uh, we may not be able to uh, match entirely the, uh, uh, the movie standards Thank you. of our uh, keynote uh, speakers today, but nonetheless, I think they bring uh, their own star power to the stage, and I'm going to ask them to uh, introduce themselves, and then we'll get started on the uh, session. Great, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Robin Brooks. I am the chief economist and managing director at the IIF. I basically oversee our research, and as part of that, I spend a lot of time in Turkey with our clients here in Turkey. We have about 30 financial institutions which are members of the IIF, and I, it's one of my absolute favorite things to do to come to Istanbul mm -hmm. and um, talk with them, which is what I've been doing this week. Um, before the IIF, I was at Goldman for many years, and then for many years at the IMF in Washington, D.C. Um, that's me. Good morning. I'm Ed Parker. I head up the Europe, Middle East, and Africa team in the sovereign group at Fitch Ratings. I've been at Fitch for, well, quite a few years, uh, and uh, before that I worked at the UK Treasury as an economic advisor on a range of uh, UK and international policy issues. I've been a regular visitor to Turkey over the years, including when I was the primary sovereign analyst covering the country. Um, hello everyone, my name is Zeynep Yenel. I'm uh, responsible for Goldman Sachs's uh, investment banking business in Turkey. I've been with Goldman for about 13 years and uh, I've had the Turkey responsibility for the last four years. Before that I was in New York and London doing other things. Um, what we do in Turkey is, in a you know, nutshell, it is try to bring foreign investors into Turkey either um, in M&A transactions, equity transactions, or debt transactions. So that's, uh, that's what I spend most of my time on. Great, thank you. Uh, and I'm Mark Howarth. I'm from Bloomberg in London, and I look after our uh, European market uh, strategy. 
Um, going to try, uh, we'll take some questions from the audience later. Uh, we're going to try our low tech uh, polling system again, uh, a show of hands uh, from the audience. Uh, and our question is, um, which macro trend do you believe most affects emerging market investment at the moment? And I have uh, five choices uh, for you to uh, show. Uh, firstly, a uh, quantitative easing or and, uh, zero rate interest rate policies. Second one, trade tariffs. Third one, the rise of automation. Uh, the fourth one, the lack of investable instruments. And the fifth one, uh, environmental concerns. So I'll run through those if you uh, put your hands up as to which you think is the, the factor which most affects uh, uh, EM investment. Uh, QE and uh, zero interest rates. Okay, reasonable, reasonable thing. Our uh, low-tech polling is working better than it did yesterday. Uh, trade tariffs. Okay, a couple. Uh, the rise of automation. Yep, down there. Uh, the lack of investable instruments. Very frustrated uh, portfolio manager there. No others. Um, environmental concerns. And uh, a few there. I'm going to give it just to uh, QE and uh, low interest rate environment, uh, which is handy because that is uh, one of the topics that we'll be picking up in the questions. But let's start with a sort of a broader uh, response. Uh, and Ed, you know, what, what's your view on the, the broad macro trends that we are, we're facing at the moment? Sure, well, I, I think your question highlighted that there's really an extensive menu of potential concerns in terms of the, the global macro outlook. So, so let me try and quickly run through a few of them and how we see them at, at Fitch. First of all, I'd say um, sluggish global growth. We see world GDP growth slowing um, next year, only around 2.5%, which would be the weakest since 2012. Unpredictable and unstable US trade policy, I think, is a major factor behind that. So that's a deterring investment. It's also making it harder for other countries to calibrate their policy responses. And I think overall globalization has been good for emerging markets. It's provided opportunities to export, to import capital and know-how. So if that is stalling, as seems likely, or going into reverse, then I would see that as a negative. And countries that are relatively open or exposed to volatile political relationships with the US and so are vulnerable to US sanctions policy, uh, most in the firing line, and I'd certainly include Turkey in that category. I think less prominently, we're also seeing a, a downturn in foreign direct investment from developed markets. So that's making emerging markets more dependent on more volatile sources of capital like portfolio inflows and, and bank inflows. I think the uh, QE and low interest rates are, are here to stay, but we only see those partially offsetting some of these headwinds to global growth. I think it's a case of um, two wrongs not making a right. Also, I think there is a, a sort of a fragility to global financial market conditions at the moment, and we know from experience that when a shock occurs, it's emerging markets, rightly or wrongly, that are usually first in the firing line, um, even if, if, if that shock is emanating from developed markets. On my list, I would also include political risk. I think there's, um, well, one, there's a number of regional conflicts that are persisting. There's also increasing uh, public discontent over inequality and economic unfairness. We have seen quite a few um, cases of social unrest breaking out around the world and certainly wouldn't be surprising to see more of that in 2020. A couple of issues to also quickly mention, the level of the US dollar and commodity prices. These are always very important for emerging markets, highly correlated with uh, sovereign emerging market ratings. Not really on the radar at the moment, but certainly something to keep track of. Quick mention of um, ESG risks that, that, uh, that you asked about. I think this is something that investors are coming much more concerned about and is a genuine issue for emerging market credit worthiness. Uh, I think particularly climate change, which is something that people haven't really uh, factored in too much in terms of um, their investment decisions thus far. 
So I think countries that are small, undiversified, or in harm's way in terms of some of these climate change are most exposed. And then just finally, you mentioned technology. There seems to be a sort of general perception that some of the latest wave of technological inventions, things like AI, robotics, 3D printing, is bad for emerging markets. That sounds a bit simplistic to me, and some of the other more recent uh, technology, you know, mobile telecoms, apps and the sharing economy, solar power, drones, I think th these are all good for emerging markets, so I think it's a little bit more nuanced. Um, but yeah, overall, certainly a lot of issues for us to keep track on um, as we head into 2020. Okay, slightly, slightly gloomy uh, uh, prognostication there. Uh, Zenith, do you have any more bullish uh, <laughs> indicators that we can uh, take advantage of? Um, well, I, I, I have bullish, bullish points um, about Turkey, um, but it, I think in overall emerging markets, um, people like to invest in growth, um, which has been um, reduced in the rest of the world, and in emerging markets, it's still um, quite, quite decent in some countries. I think Turkey benefits from that, even though we had our own growth reduced. So I think um, people turn to emerging markets when Western world um, has its own issues um, and uh, it doesn't give, give them the return they want. All of a sudden, emerging markets risks and some of the lag, lagging um, uh, points on some of the trends that, um, that, that were mentioned um, can be overlooked. Go on, coming to you then uh, for some, uh, some upbeat trends and uh, uh, things that we might be able to take advantage of. You know, it's been a weird time for emerging markets. The last two years have been very, very difficult. Um, currencies have weakened very significantly, and obviously the Turkish lira has fallen significantly over the last two years, but many, many other currencies have fallen as well. So it's not just Turkey, it's Argentina, Brazil, Chile a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a long list. And so you have to ask yourself, what is it that is happening and are these moves permanent? Uh, and do they say something to us about a fundamental issue or should we be nervous about a problem? And I do think that um, there is an underlying issue about uh, we had three decades of globalization, we are now gonna have a period of deglobalization and fundamentally that is a challenge for emerging markets. I agree uh, emerging markets like Turkey have a great growth potential, um, but I think you have to be, the hurdle for unlocking that potential going forward, I think, is going to be higher. Okay. Well, sort of staying with that theme and, and picking up the response to our, our poll, which said that uh, uh, the larger concern was over zero and negative interest rate policies. I mean, uh, what do you think is the, what's the outlook for those policies and, and from that outlook, what is going yep. to be the impact on emerging markets? So I don't want to be uh, dismissive of the Fed or the ECB. The ECB now is doing its second QE program and has cut interest rates more negative, and the Fed cut, uh, cut interest rates uh, three times this year um, and may cut more. And typically in the past, that was something that would really benefit emerging markets when there's this kind of concerted easing from the big central banks, it, it lifts emerging markets, and especially emerging market currency, local currency debt, and that's not been the case at all uh, this year. Um, the S&P 500, as a gauge for risk appetite, has actually had a pretty decent year, especially recently, um, but emerging markets haven't benefited, and so I think, honestly, uh, the monetary policy nexus is kind of a sideshow for EM. I think the EM issues are much more idiosyncratic. I think Turkey is a great example. I think there's a great onus on policy here, like in other places, like in Argentina, for example. And so, you know, you, you, you make the soup at home in your kitchen, and so that's where you should be. That's where you should focus your energy. Okay. Is that it? Uh, outlook for negative interest rates and, and the impact? Yeah. The outlook for negative interest rates? Um, well, the, the outlook is, is that we expect um, this trend to continue for, for the near term. Um, as Robin mentioned, there's a lot of other factors um, impacting that. Um, there's unpredictable um, uh, managers across the world uh, at, the, at the macro level. So 
Um, I agree that, um, you know, even though interest rates might uh, remain um, uh, low, um, I agree that, um, you know, investing decisions um, are now more being shaped by more macro risks. Uh, yeah, well, I think, I mean, why do we have such low interest rates in developed countries? It's because growth is so subdued and inflation is overly low. So on a net basis, that can't be good for emerging markets either. But, you know, that said, global interest rates are supportive, particularly for countries like Turkey that has um, significant net external debt, low savings, so low interest rates help with that. Also, to the extent that it encourages risk appetite, again, you know, that, that can be supportive to emerging markets. And I think it, it, it's no coincidence that some of the, well, the partial recovery we've seen in sentiment towards Turkey since the summer has been since we've seen this further leg down in, in global bond prices. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it can help, but it, it doesn't really deal with the underlying fundamentals. Uh, maybe just one other thought um, that um, to the extent that low interest rates in, in the West re reflects um, sort of excess capital and shortage of people, then emerging markets like Turkey that are sort of more in the reverse position, then you know, it could actually be helpful to their terms of trade um, you know, if they're the opposite to most of the rest of the world. Okay. All right, so let, let, let's narrow it down a little bit then. Uh, and, and, and what are the particular considerations for Turkey as opposed to these more general uh, global themes? I think it would be um, helpful to put Turkey in the context of broader emerging markets. So Turkey um, has a se about $750 million of GDP. It was a bit higher in dollar terms, obviously, unfortunately now lower. But that still makes Turkey the seventh largest economy in Europe uh, and 19th largest in the world. So it's it's to take a step back, it's absolutely a market that um, investors uh, focus on and want to take a view on and keep active. Um, it's a G20 country, so these are all um, special, um, I think, you know, it differentiates Turkey within, uh, within the broader emerging markets. Um, I'll, I'll focus on the positives on the considerations. There are several areas that make Turkey attractive. It is, uh, you know, it has a big public market. Um, there's no restrictions on foreign ownership. It's an easily exchangeable currency, so people are able to buy Turkish assets, sell them quite freely and quite regularly um, and quickly. So unlike some of the other um, emerging markets where there's more restrictions around these, Turkey has a robust legal system. So all of that has made Turkey um, quite, I think, attractive and special. Obviously, as, um, as Robin mentioned from an investor's perspective, um, the most, uh, the hardest uh, proposition about investing in Turkey has been the volatile currency, because you know most of these funds have their their um, their funds in dollars or euros, and um, they run them on a return basis. And even if the underlying businesses in Turkey may perform, the currency can wipe out all of those returns very quickly, um, and can be very painful for an, for a foreign investor. So I think some stability um, goes a long way. Um, we have um, been seeing some stability in the currency this year, uh, at least after a very volatile year last year, which already, I think, um, shows in the numbers of investment that we've been receiving across debt, equity, uh, and, and M&A. So I, I, I think that's the, that's the number one area that Turkey needs to focus on. Okay. And Robin, special investment considerations uh, for Turkey compared to other markets? Yeah, so I think Zainab is right. The the currency is definitely uh, in focus for foreign investors, right? You, um, if you are based in the Eurozone or if you are based in the United States, then currency risk is a major issue that you need to hedge, and hedging that is expensive. Um, and so the direction of Turkish lira is very important. I would say the following. So. You know, in 2017, uh, growth in Turkey was very high, right? It was over 7%, and there was a big current account deficit and a bunch of other things that were going on. And that proved to be a mix that was um, unsustainable. And the Turkish lira ended up falling in 2018, basically as a result. It actually 
fell during my summer vacation and it ended my summer vacation. And I, I think it was a very stressful time for many people. Um, so I think that has changed for the better. We have a current account that's basically been balanced, so that's really good. That's, uh, I can't remember the last time that was the case. It's, it's, it's really remarkable. And the challenge now is going to be growth. How, with the balanced current account, do you get growth back? Uh, I had a meeting yesterday where someone was telling me, I don't know if this statistic is correct, but uh, Turkey needs about a million new jobs every year for the unemployment rate to remain roughly in, uh, unchanged, and 1% um, growth gets you 200,000 jobs, right? So you really need 5% growth per year for the economy to kind of uh, tread water, if you will. And so I think the challenge will be how to do that in a lira-stabilizing way. Okay, okay. Well, we'll come back to a couple of those points, I think. In a minute, but I, I just wanted to pick up one of the points, uh, Zainab, uh, you mentioned that the, I mean, you, you described really quite positive uh, uh, structural setup, quite positive uh, components uh, of the economy and the investment uh, environment. What, what things do you think Turkey should look at to improve their attractiveness to foreign, play, foreign interest in players? Well, I think there are macro issues and more micro issues at company level that can be improved. I think at the macro level, um, uh, policy is very important in Turkey, as Robin mentioned. Uh, I think we, you know, Turkey um, suffers a little bit from bad PR. Um, uh, I'll say in a Bloomberg organized uh, event. Um, there was, I remember seven, eight years ago in, uh, you, know, you know, in mid 2000s, there was a lot of very positive PR around Turkey. Uh, you would run into all the uh, big investors on the flight from London to Istanbul. Um, and that was maybe a little bit exaggerated too. Um, and now I think there's a there's a very negative PR that's also sometimes um, getting too muddled by the macro themes. Um, obviously, we live in a tough neighborhood. Um, there's obviously um, macro events happening on our borders. Uh, our um, our government is um, is taking an active uh, view on foreign uh, foreign policy. It, it may not be um, always in line with what the rest of the world may want. So I think there is the impact of that negative PR into the financial markets when the fundamentals um, may not be as bad um, is something that we can all take a step back and reflect on and think about. And I think everyone in this room has a little bit of a duty to um, help convey um, messages um, of reality. Um, I think at the micro level, at the company level, um, there are several things um, that can be improved. Um, for example, I think uh, from a corporate governance perspective, um, investors want to, there's been a couple of big emerging markets failures that came from poor corporate governance. It even happens in the West, by the way, look at WeWorks. So um, I think corporate governance is becoming more and more important for investors. Because um, last thing an investor wants is, it, is, is be you know, investing in a, in a stock or a, or a debt of a company, which then takes a hit because there was poor governance. It just reflects poorly on their own due diligence. So I think, um, I think you know we can improve that uh, at the company level in Turkey, having professional boards, having the right checks and balances. Um, like most um, new economies and, and uh, growth economies, lots of companies in Turkey are still founder owned and family managed. I think there's some way to go on that. Um, s separately, I think people need to manage at micro level, again, capital structures a little bit better. Um, this is a message to um, CFOs around the, around the room. Um, I think when foreign investors are, are looking to put money into a capital markets instrument in Turkey, uh, it may be bonds, again, it may be public equities. They want to make sure, they want to see a capital structure that's quite robust and can survive the vo inherent volatility that is always here with us in Turkey. Turkey and will continue to be. So, you know, having a diversified sources of funds is important. Primarily, Turkish companies always relied on Turkish banks to fund them, to fund their growth, um, which was shorter term uh, credit that always rolled uh, but had no guarantees in tough times. So, I think from an international investor's perspective, you want to see longer term capital structures, more diversified sources of funds, more access to, if there is, a, for example, a 
and international uh, capital markets bond in the, in, in the capital structure. I think an investor feels better about investing equity into that company. So I think at micro level, um, those two are the um, focus items that I think companies should focus on to improve investment. Okay. Uh, Robin, so in order to achieve these 5% plus growth targets, is, it a, is that only feasible if inbound f uh, investment flows can be improved? And if so, what, uh, what's best to do about that? So I think Turkey has, uh, you know, and Zainab touched on this, uh, Turkey has incredible strengths. Uh, I am always impressed, uh, and obviously here I meet mostly with people from the fa financial system, people like yourselves. Uh, I'm in impressed by the high quality of education and knowledge, always. Uh, people are incredibly hardworking and diligent and so the human capital is really high in Turkey. I love that, it's fantastic. And it's a huge strength. Um, and it's something that should be cultivated and obviously Istanbul, when I talk, tell people I'm going on a business trip to Istanbul, everyone's like, oh my God, that's where I would like to go. Um, so there are huge advantages. I think the, um, the uh, challenge uh, is to be patient. Um, uh, so maybe growth in 2020 is not going to be 5%. Maybe it'll be 4%. It's not the end of the world. Um, it's better to build a foundation um, and, and, and put in place policies that will bring investment back. Um, Turkey historically has had consumption-based growth. It's been the reason why we've had big current account deficits and why the Turkish lira has weakened for so long. And I think we need to do, all of us, me included, I spend a lot of time talking about this with um, financial institutions here and with policymakers. It's, it's incumbent on all of us to think about what can we do to shift that growth model a bit and get investment going, get foreign investors uh, to come to Turkey. It's absolutely key. And, Turkey has a fantastic uh, locational advantage close to Africa. You know, someday Europe will start growing again. And so I think then the position is quite good. But I think the focus has to be on investment. And for that, you have to be patient and not do short run pump priming. Okay. So, and, and a similar theme, but you talked earlier about an excess of capital in some of the developed markets and also uh, a general reduction in um, uh, cross-border FDI flows. Um, so where, where is that money going? And uh, or w why is it not going if it isn't going somewhere? And how could some more of it be attracted into Turkey? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the reasons FDI has, has fallen so much is because of the uncertainty over the world economy, in particular US trade policy. So, you know, companies are just reluctant to invest at the moment because they don't really know, you know what's going to happen. And also potentially if you build a factory somewhere, then that could be trapped behind new tariff barriers or sanctions or something like that. So I think uh, people are just more cautious before putting that money to work. Um, so going back further, I mean, since the global financial crisis, we've also seen a a marked drop off in, in global capital flows. Um, so that does make emerging markets a bit more dependent on, on portfolio inflows, which you know, traditionally you know, we tend to think of as hot money, um, you know, more can, can flow out more quickly again. Um, I mean, where is that money going? Uh, well, I guess it's uh, sort of pumping up Western financial markets, um, equities driving down bond yields even lower. Um, uh, you could question whether that's um, you know, really an optimal allocation of global resources, but you know, that's you know, perhaps what, what we're really seeing at the moment. Okay, all right. I'm going to take some uh, audience questions. I've got a couple that have come through on the uh, pad here, uh, but I'll come back out to the audience in a second. But let's start with one of these, quite interesting one, I think, um, which is uh, the opportunity for uh, Turkey to be a regional energy hub and uh, have that as a, uh, I guess, as an export service, uh, really. Um, I, would anybody like to uh, pick that? Any energy experts uh, uh, in the panel would like to pick that one up? Or do I, do I, do I pick somebody at <laughs> random? <laughs> I'm happy to um, yeah. speak to that. So, um, I mean, the A weakness 
has been in the past that uh, Turkey has relied on energy imports, um, basically for um, ever. To forever. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and um, that has been in the past a key driver of um, the current account deficit, which which in the end has been, you know, the millstone for the currency. So. I think if you had uh, your own resources, uh, whether they are renewable or whether there's a gas discovery or shale or whatever, I think that would be a potential game changer um, for the lira. Now, we, we have seen other emerging markets obviously make big discoveries. Brazil had the salt basin and uh, recently had auctions um, to attract foreign investment. And the Brazilian real hasn't benefited um, it's quite weak. So this is no panacea. It's not a one one stop solution, but I think it would be part of um, turning uh, the dynamic on the currency for Turkey. Okay. And I think within energy, um, renewables is probably an area where Turkey could have a more of an edge. Yep. Uh, as Robin said, we don't have many natural resources to create energy from, but we have uh, wind, uh, we're right by the Aegean, we have uh, sun, um, we have uh, great hydro plants, so I think renewables is, is an area that um, the uh, ministry has been focusing on, as you all know. I think that's, uh, we st as Go Goldman at least, we still see more of an investment opportunity into renewable um, focused or renewable heavy energy businesses, and I think that's the, that's, that, that's the uh, outlook for us in the near to, to medium term. Okay. Mm -hmm one area where there is potential is that there have been these huge gas finds in the eastern Mediterranean, so off Israel, Egypt, Lebanon, and, and around Cyprus. And um, it's very difficult to get that gas out to a viable market. Uh, Turkey is the logical place for it to be an outlet uh, for that gas to go to Europe, but that's just not going to happen unless there's changes in political relationships. Okay, understood. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's see if we have any other questions uh, from the floor. Anybody have anything for our steam one over there. Yes, gentlemen. Hello. Uh, if, I'm, uh, I'm also asking all of you, uh, uh, what would be the uh, next uh, Global fiscal crisis that made shape the, the reason may, that might be triggered. Uh, for, uh, this is uh, off the record. Yeah, I am asking your off the record uh, thoughts about what would trigger the next fiscal crisis. Okay. All right. So uh, the question was, uh, without committing yourselves, uh, where is it all going to go wrong next, uh, and uh, where is the next global financial uh, crisis going to um, come from? Would like to? Sure. Um, that's an easy one. Um, <laughs> so, you know, think about the last couple of months. Uh, the world has been, and the investing community, asset managers, have been focused on one thing. Uh, and in fact, I was recently giving a presentation in, at a big asset manager in Boston, and they said to me, there's really only one question that matters right now, and that is, is the United States going into recession? Is the world going to recession or not? And why is that so important? It's because at the time, 10-year Treasury yield was at 1.7, right, which is very low historically. And so that typically in most models would say, you know, government bonds in the U.S. and elsewhere are kind of expensive. You don't want to buy them. Um, but if there's a recession, then... Um, 10-year uh, yield can go a lot lower, and so it's a binary choice. And so there has been a lot of focus on recession and weakening. The United States recovery is very long now. It's very old, and so people are really worried about that. I don't think that's what the issue is going to be, um, because uh, the services part of the United States economy, and in fact for many other economies, is still looking quite healthy, and in the United States, services are 90% of GDP. What I do think is happening is that um, 
the world is becoming much more unpredictable, right? And relationships that we have taken for granted uh, are no longer as strong. So there are tensions within NATO. There are tensions between the US and China. Um, there's all kinds of uncertainty. And you know, sometimes people say the wrong thing and something can escalate. And in many respects, what happened for Turkey in August 2018, right? The sanctions because of this Pastor Brunson thing, I mean, that took Turkish lira above seven intraday, right? And so there is an element of unpredictability here in the world now, which I think is really, really important for emerging markets to listen to and to be very careful about. So what does it mean specifically for Turkey? Um, it means that if in the past the equilibrium current account deficit for Turkey was maybe three or four percent, okay, I think these days that's over. Uh, I think the equilibrium current account, the biggest current account deficit that Turkey can afford these days maybe is two. I think things have changed. The world is more unpredictable. And so just to be ready uh, for this unpredictability, I think you want to be more modest. Okay. Ed? Yeah. Well, I think first off, um, economists and others are, are very bad at actually predicting where the next crisis is, is going to come from, and it's usually not where the last one came from. Um, just inherently difficult to predict. Otherwise, you know, maybe it wouldn't really happen in the first place. But you know, I think a, a couple of, um, if we're thinking about potential tail risks, then I think one would be the the U.S.-China relationship, and. I think this, this is not just about Trump, it's not just about trade sanctions, it goes much deeper than that. It's about long-term rivalry over technology, economic power, military and political power. And, and those are things which are not going to go away any time any, soon with a, with a quick trade deal. So I think that's something that does have the potential to really aggravate some of these um, other sort of economic and, and political risks uh, that, that we see in the world. I think a, a, another thing that concerns us is some of the talk that uh, seems to be generating quite a lot of momentum about um, really using central banks for sort of quasi-fiscal purposes or, or even sort of social policy, sort of people's quantitative easing, um, pursuing environmental and social governance type rules. I think central banks' credibility and balance sheets are really the most important backstop for economic stability. And once you start um, playing with their credibility, then I think you're getting into very dangerous territory. Okay. Sir? Um, not to be repetitive, maybe I'll tie it all to, to, to Turkey, because I think investment into Turkey um, also obviously gets impacted by what's happening in Turkish economy and what's happening with Turkish politics. but. Maybe to a greater extent, it, it has to do about global dynamics and what, um, what's happening in the global macro. And I think um, Turkey has been lucky that in this turmoilous period, I will call the last two years for, for Turkey, both from a macroeconomic perspective, very high inflation, volatile currency, negative growth, but also from a, 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 a political perspective, that terminalist period has been relatively unpainful, I would say, from an investment perspective. We, we still see demand for Turkey. Sovereign issued a bond last week, which was $2.5 billion, largest issuance since 2014. There's still demand for Turkey, and I think two factors help that a lot, the low interest rate environment globally and the low um, oil prices, uh, because as Robin mentioned previously, we, are, uh, we rely on that a lot. Um, if that changes, all of a sudden, I think the implications for Turkey could be severe and not necessarily something where there's a lot of um, a lot that, that Turkish policymakers can do to fix. Um, so I think it's a very good question from that perspective that it's something to keep an eye on um, as it would have um, it could have severe impacts on, on Turkey. Okay. So uh, further that, so, so Turkey specific and, and uh, a question that's come in here, I'm going to paraphrase it slightly. It's a currency. Uh, related, we, obviously we've talked about the currency uh, being very volatile recently. Are we at the right level now or are there further significant movements uh, to come? Um, it's directed at me, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, uh, I think the Turkish currency um, gets, can change quite rapidly for e in either direction as a result of uh, monetary policy and right communication around it. Um, so as long as monetary policy is 
is managed proactively and is and and is communicated to the investing world um, in a uh, in a uh, understandable manner, then I think our currency is probably at a decent level right now and can be sustained at this level. Um, well, we think that will be the case, uh, and 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 therefore, um, you know, that that will support inflation also remaining relatively um, where it is right now at around 10% levels, hopefully in the near term. So uh, I think as long as um, uh, monetary policy is managed accurately, I think it's, it's, it's a fair, uh, fair place for the currency. Okay. Any current that's support? a big if uh, though, right? Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, um, well, I was really going to make a similar point that, yeah, I think if you look at the current level, if you look at things like real exchange rates, then the, the lira certainly doesn't seem expensive at the moment. But uh, looking forward, much depends on, on monetary policy. I mean, inflation in Turkey is an, an absolute outlier. I mean, not talking about at the moment, but going back to the previous decade or even longer, if you like. It's extremely high and volatile in Turkey. And obviously, high inflation means that over time, the exchange rate is likely to, de to depreciate. Also, high volatile inflation is going to mean um, generally higher and more volatile interest rates, more volatile uh, exchange rate, um, also making investing in, in local currency assets less attractive. So you know, for us, monetary uh, policy credibility is an extremely important issue that we're focused on in Turkey. Robin, you, I mean, you touched on it. Any other points? Or so I um, spend a lot of time thinking about Turkish lira and uh, um, what its equilibrium should be. And you know, I've, uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter, and I get made fun of on Twitter a lot for my fair value for Turkish lira, which is still 550. And in fact, we've just been rerunning our models, and, and that is still our fair value. I, I actually, in Washington, D.C., before I left on this trip, was trying to explain to my kids why my nickname here is 550 Robin. Um, now, what I would say is, you know, how do I see the risks around that uh, number? A fair value, uh, it's not a forecast, it's just an equilibrium, right? And it's a bit, uh, a bit of art in, in picking that number. These fair value models are not science. But um, a fair value model should be a line, and then the currency kind of goes around that, right? And so what I've seen in Turkish lira is that we really haven't been below 550. So we should be above, and then we should be below. We really haven't been below 550 in quite a while, since March, I think. Uh, and that, of course, was the month of the big credit stimulus before the uh, municipal elections here in Turkey. and so. Um, I think the risks are that the equilibrium value for the lira is shifting gradually higher, uh, meaning the current dollar TRY, the equi equilibrium is shifting higher, and that also has a good reason, which is that obviously there's an inflation differential vis-a-vis -vis other countries, and so you want a little bit of weakening. When I've been talking to our clients here this week, I think the consensus forecast, this is not my forecast, so this is a consensus forecast from people here in town, by the end of next year is maybe something like 630. Um, and I think that's possible. Um, I am still hopeful that we end somewhere closer to 550 right now. All right, thank you. That's definitely not the worst thing I've heard people uh, be called on Twitter. Um, so I hope we answered your uh, question. So it wasn't too gloomy, I think, as, a, as a, an answer. Uh, any other uh, questions in from the floor? Uh, somebody there, gentleman there, I think. Um, hello, I would like to uh, ask about uh, the Chinese relations. As you mentioned, uh, the American and Chinese trade war has happened, and uh, there has been some problems in Hong Kong. There are resistance is uh, growing and um, some claim that China will replace the uh, United States in the world economy and Chinese growth is slowing down uh, in time and some saying the Eastern Asia is heating up and China will be pushed into political instability. I, will, I would like to ask you about the what will happen in China in future and Chinese Western relations and their effects on uh, future and finances. 
Right, I think that's slightly out of uh, the scope of, of the panel. We've talked about uh, trade tariffs and the issues around uh, trade tariffs. Uh, I'll just ask, is there anything specific around Chinese um, investment? Obviously, Belt and Road uh, uh, is coming over you know, almost to the borders. Anything specific about the Chinese side that you want to pick up quickly? Otherwise, I'll, I'll take another question. I mean, let me, let me say this, yeah. uh, and let me answer the question in a bit of a broader context. So, um, the, the, you know, the, what I said before was the future for Turkey is investment, and the future for Turkey is exports. It's not imports, and it's not consumption. Um, and so, when globally there are trade tensions between China and the United States, that is something that weighs on exports. Right? It makes, and it makes the investment climate more difficult. Um, now, the good news is uh, I've spent the last couple of weeks looking at this issue carefully, and it's actually one of the core debates in Washington, um, at the IMF, and so forth. Can exports go up when the currency has weakened so much? And Ed said the, you know, the Turkish lira has fallen a lot, even in real terms. So Turkey is one of the places where exports really have grown quite a lot. They're up 25% since 2013 in volume terms. Um, and so I think that's good. But obviously, exports to China haven't done well. And so, um, you know, for, for, for Turkish business people, this is of direct relevance because they need to think about which market do I position myself for. And so maybe Africa is better than Asia at the moment. And I think one other thing I can add um, uh, with regards to China and Turkey more specifically, um, as, as tensions between China and the U.S. have risen, um, there's been obviously a, an absolute stop to Chinese investment into the U.S. Uh, uh, and even into Western Europe. We, in sort of, I would say, in early 2010s, we saw a lot of, uh, ac you know, companies, Chinese companies buying companies in the U.S. or in Western Europe. Uh, with the political tensions that has come to uh, pretty much a stop, I would say, um, that money and, and China overall has reduced their um, appetite to buy companies outside, there's capital controls, etc. But there is still money flowing out um, strategically and that money is going to, now has to go to other places than Western and developed world. And I think Turkey has benefited from that sum. So if we look at M&A um, activity in the last um, two years, since the beginning of 2018, there's been a, a $10 billion worth of foreign investment into just, I'm talking about mergers and acquisitions, and of which there's a significant portion that came from Chinese companies buying, uh, buying Turkish companies. An example, Alibaba invested um, uh, over $700 million into Trandiol, which values the company over a, over a billion dollars. They have bought some ports um, and some infrastructure assets. So, so I think there is that, um, that uh, aspect of China, US and China, Western Europe relations that would have an impact on Turkey. I think we also see this on the debt side. Um, more Chinese banks, um, such as ICBC, Bank of China, are devoting bigger balance sheets to Turkey. Um, and uh, we have seen them take uh, take large investment tickets into into uh, Turkish loans that we, at, at least as Goldman, have uh, underwrote and, and brokered uh, and agented. Nope. nope. All right. Uh, there was a there was a question from the floor. I think we'll take uh, we'll still take one more. I'll do the poll. Thank you very much. I want to ask a question about gold. You know, the ounce price is now is down in the, in today's uh, about uh, going down, in the, but it's coming from uh, $1,900. And uh, some people say as uh, next decade it will be about $10,000 one ounce. What do you think about this gold? And secondly, I want to ask a question about China. One road, one belt project. You know. It's influenced Turkey uh, more than other countries because one train is 12 days from China to Europe, it will be arrived. As how can we, uh, how can we uh, protect our SMS companies from Chinese 
Thank you very much. Okay, um, we're only going to skip the the gold question. I don't think we have a, a, a gold issue for uh, Turkey, but uh, the, uh, the the growth of SMEs in in the in the country and the development of the SME uh, market and, and its attractiveness to foreign in investors is that uh, something that is going well, um, in your opinion, or is it something where there can be improvements uh, uh, made? Uh, your, can your you um, repeat the question? Sure. So the, the SME market in Turkey, so the companies that haven't quite mm -hmm. made it onto the public markets mm -hmm. uh, yet, uh, the attractiveness of uh, those early stage companies or, or pre-public market companies to uh, FDI investment for, from China and from other, other places, is that something that is uh, generally uh, a positive for the for the Turkish uh, economy and the Turkish investment opportunity, or is it something that is a, uh, a concern and there's more effort needs to be put in to make those uh, those companies more efficient, more attractive to foreign investors? I think generally, I mean, I'm I'm a supporter of free markets and uh, and people investing in uh, in you know foreign investment coming to Turkey. I think is a positive period, whether it comes from China, the U.S., Africa. I don't think I think it's um, secondary, but. You know, Turkey is, is a country that has very strong um, fundamentals, big economy, big population, young, growing, etc. To support that, I don't think Turkey can do with its own um, capital and own resources. We rely on external, uh, external funding. Period. So uh, I think any investment uh, is is positive, and I think that includes companies, Chinese companies investing into Turkish companies that. Um, uh, I don't see anything negative in that, frankly. And I think in the medium to, to long term, it will it will benefit Turkey um, for sure. Okay. Ed, always in favour cross border investment. Um, yeah. Well, I was just gonna gonna say that um, the Turkish government has this new economic program, and and some of the measures in there, things like uh, improving insolvency procedures. Um, uh, dealing with severance pay, pensions, I think all of those things that can help to make the labor market more flexible, you know, should be positive for the economy and, and the investment climate in Turkey. But, you know, we have seen similar sort of plans before. Um, without any scheduled political uh, events, elections, referendums for till 2023, now is a fantastic opportunity for the government to push forward with some of those reforms. Uh, equally, if they don't do so, I think it would be revealing. So you know, I think it is a test for, for their ambition. And, and maybe on a, make a sort of related point, again, thinking about the attractiveness of, of Turkey as an investment destination, that um, if we look at things like the World Bank governance indicators, the real sort of international benchmark, then Turkey has seen the third greatest fall in its percentile ranking in those in the last three years behind just uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador. So I think the deterioration in governance is also something that, you know, if Turkey were to turn that round, then you know, that is also something that could make the country more attractive for international investors. Okay. Robin, anything specific? No, I guess nothing no, to add to that. All right, so I think we're, we're, we'll wrap up. We, we'll, uh, we've got time for, I think, uh, a sort of a closing poll just to see uh, if we've moved audience opinion. So again, we'll be going to the low-tech, hands-in-the-air uh, approach. And the question is, what is the area that uh, Turkey should concentrate on most to enhance its uh, attractiveness to uh, investors? And the choices are um, attracting uh, foreign investors, specifically, uh, building up the local capital market, uh, number three, increasing the pool of specialist knowledge locally. And four is uh, influencing global policies. Uh, so we'll just go through those and uh, raise your hands. Uh, the area Turkey should concentrate on most to enhance its attractiveness to investors. Um, who thinks uh, that it should be focused on attracting foreign investment coming into the uh, country? Which is an area we've touched on quite a lot during the panel. Uh, yeah, a few there. Um, the building up uh, more of a, a local cap capital market and, and attracting more local investors into the market. Okay. Um, increasing the pool of local uh, specialist knowledge. Got one there. A couple there. So, and uh, influencing global policies. The country should uh, seek to do that. So more on that. So more of a, a role maybe on the world stage in, in uh, uh, more general areas. Um, so just to, to sum up, uh, do we think we've moved the 
audience along. Any uh, any surprises there? That the, uh, the 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 marginal result of the poll was that the the best focus is on influencing global policy. Um, that would be good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, if, if Turkey can help with global policy, we need the help. Uh, so uh, that's, that's great. All right. <laughs> heard it there. It's direct from Washington. Uh, okay. uh, I think also, just if you concentrate on policies that make the local investment climate positive, then I think that also attracts foreigners. So it's not really one or the other. Okay. Is that it? Is that I think of the four choices that you have given the audience, uh, by the way, I've noticed that lots of hands were uh, rose for the first one, very few for the second one. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think we need both. Yeah. Uh, we need both foreign investment uh, and Turkish companies accessing international capital markets, but we also need a robust local capital market, which is, I think, um, quite um, shallow right now compared to the um, size of the economy in Turkey. Um, so I think I, th that's something I noticed from the audience poll, um, that there was lack of hands on the second choice, but I think it's equally important. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you for that uh, fascinating run through a whole range of, uh, of topics and, and the demonstration of just how attractive Turkey is as uh, an investment opportunity. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, take the opportunity to thank the panel for giving us their time and expertise uh, today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and distinguished panelists. Mr. Howard is familiar with the concept that has been, uh, saplings has been layered for you in Izmir province. Okay. And now there will be a small certificate ceremony for those uh, young trees. And I would like to invite Turkey Sarmai Piyasaları Birliği Bağımsız Yönetim Kurulu üyesi, Professor Dr. Güler Aras'ı davet etmek istiyorum. Konuklarımız adına ekilen fidanlar var. O fidanlarla ilgili sertifikaları kendilerine takdim etmek için. Buyurun efendim. Çok teşekkür ederim. Thank you. Thank you. Bu arada değerli konuklarıma hemen, hemen duyurmak isterim. Thank you. Salonun hazırlanması ve panelistlerimizin hazırlanmasının ardından bir sonraki panelimiz Etki amaçlı yatırım yeni bir moda mı yoksa kazançlı bir iş modeli mi başlıklı oturumumuz başlayacaktır efendim kısa bir süre sonra. Thank you very much, sir.